Excellent. Thank you, Candace. So yes, I'm I'm excited to spend the next hour uh, or so speaking with everyone and welcoming you to this conversation about addressing cybersecurity challenges in open source software. Um, this comes on the heels of uh, joint collaboration between both Sneak and the Linux Foundation of um, authoring our annual sort of state of open source security report. So recently released, what we'll be doing is actually going through some of the interesting data that was um, gathered through that report and sharing some of the, the common themes, discussing those, discussing, you know, potentially some of the trends and reasons behind some of the information that, that we're seeing. So without further ado, it's best to probably start with some of the information and insight and details as to what did the report um, consist of? Um, how was it created? What, a little bit of the background um, behind it. As I mentioned, it was co-authored uh, between the Linux Foundation and one of the authors is, is joining us on the, the call today, Steve, um, as well as um, information and data specifically from Sneak, information and some statistics in order to share some insight um, of what we're seeing in the industry. The research for this report started back in, in March and as part of that research, um, in order to build out the surveys and the questions that we wanted to ask of the industry. There were multiple interviews, 15 different interviews that were um, performed in conjunction with open source software maintainers, cybersecurity experts to make sure that we were asking the right questions of the information and data that we wanted to, to extract. Um, the survey itself launched in just April of this year, and it actually targeted a fairly broad spectrum of, of individuals. So everyone from open open source software maintainers to core contributors, um, some occasional contributors, developers of software that are actually using and consuming that, um, and other individuals that were focused on the software supply chain. So broad spectrum, in, in addition to going across many different industries, everything from, from small organizations with only small handfuls of developers to you know some sample sets of organizations with very large developers. So the combination of the survey results, as well as just um, information that Sneak is able to gather based upon our interaction with a lot of our customers, is the information that's shared in that report. There were over 550 survey respondents. Um, the interviews we talked about, and those actually also spread, and we focused on sort of five key language and ecosystems that are shared uh, in the report. So with that said, in order to make this a little bit interactive, and what we do is, uh, what we thought we would do is, is queue up a quick poll. Um, and it's to get a feel for everybody that's on this, this meeting to maybe share some of your thoughts as far as when you start looking at open source and software and, and the concepts of um, direct dependencies and, and indirect dependencies, these were some of the themes that we saw in the report and that were shared. What is your confidence level as far as understanding your security risks in your direct dependencies, right? The, the open source components that developers are pulling into your applications, as well as the confidence level in indirect dependencies. And so for, for some of you that may not as be familiar with, with open source software, indirect dependencies are the ones when, when you pull in an open source package, it may actually have a dependency or use other open source components. And those components might use other open source components. And so you get this hierarchy, right? This parent-child relationship. And those lower level ones are the indirect dependencies, also sometimes referred to as transitive dependencies. So what is sort of the security risk associated with those and your confidence level and understanding if you're aware of those in your organization? One of the um, interesting aspects that we were able to um, derive and one of the themes that fell out of the report was the open source security has become basically a um, greater challenge, especially as part of the software supply chain. And, and I think um, last year it was pretty evident that the software supply chain has become a big focus um, from a security perspective, as we saw greater sort of attacks and, and different threat vectors. Um, so it looks like we've got the poll results. So this is, uh, it's actually very interesting. Um, so I see direct dependencies, 15%, somewhat, you know, as far as very confident, somewhat confidence, three quarters of you, which is actually pretty, pretty great. And then not confident about 11%. Um, 
looking at the it's obviously a, uh, an audience there using software composition analysis <laughs> it's a good point matt um indirect uh is very confident we've got four percent somewhat confident uh, two-thirds which is which is pretty awesome and then not confident but the intriguing part to me was um one of these um the data points that's actually in this software um uh, state of open source software security was 24 percent of organizations um so even a little bit higher, we actually had high level of confidence in, in direct dependencies, but that shrunk to about 18% in indirect. So not, um, if you look at the very confident, not too far off of there, but maybe even a little higher and probably somewhat in between the mixture of the, the two. So interesting to, to see some of these poll results. So with that said, um, some of the numbers that were shared in the report and some of the, again, so th these are very intriguing ones when you start to get a lot of the collective data from, from across, the org, um, uh, across the globe, right? Some of the, the information uh, shared with what organizations are using. And one of the things that was shared in the report from, from the data was projects that are using open source um, software uh, on average have about 49 vulnerabilities and these 49 vulnerabilities and again on average are spanning about 79 direct dependencies now that that very significantly across you know sort of some of the ecosystems and on the right what, what what's shared here is what those ecosystems represent right how they actually influence the the averages that you're seeing here one of the other interesting, and this is again more in some of the, the details in the open source report, was that the vulnerabilities themselves, on average, 40% of those are actually within indirect dependencies, meaning they're buried a few uh, layers deep. So with this, I would definitely love to get, you know, um, Steve, Matt, especially Steve from an authoring perspective, some of your insight as far as, you know, are these numbers surprising? Um, do, do, do you feel like there's an increase in open source usage? Um, and, and any sort of insight as far as we have these vulnerabilities, what's what sort of the difficulty associated with, with addressing them and fixing them and things that you're seeing in the industry? Right, well, one of the first things to say is that 98% of organizations use open source software in some capacity, whether it's unrestricted or uh, with certain kinds of conditions. Um, so open source is everywhere, realistically. Um, from the standpoint of dependencies, you know, we're transitioning from um, to an approach for developing software, and we have been probably for the last close to maybe five to 10 years, which is very much focused around microservices. Uh, so modern application development really does rely on smaller components, typically that have dependencies on other components. That's just stylistically, uh, the most efficient way to build build software this um, these days and with lots and lots of open source components out there and being created every day there is a real advantage to being able to from a time to market perspective and potentially even quality depending upon the quality of the components being used uh, a very strong rationale behind using open source and not being overly concerned uh, about the number of dependencies that exist. So I, I, I would expect the number of dependencies, both direct and indirect, to rise over time from the standpoint of how applications get developed. And I don't think that's a concern because of course we have tools that allow us to, to look very closely and um, scan across the portfolio to find out you know, where all of these dependencies are, where a particular uh, component is being used across the portfolio. So um, not a concern, um, but you know, once again, um, you know, good governance, you know, risk and compliance uh, controls need to be in place. Yeah, I mean, I think you know, it's, it is important, as, as Steve alluded to there, that this, this model of, um, of developing modern applications, you know, in terms of what we think typically is somewhere like a 80, 20% split of uh, homegrown code versus um, you know, uh, uh, pre-packaged modules, pre-packaged libraries that have been brought in. That's been a tremendous driver for innovation, right? Because it means that people don't have to reinvent the wheel, you know, and, and it, it's really enabled people to, to speed up tremendously, you know, the, the software development uh, process. We're creating much more software, 
And uh, so there's been a, a generally a, a very beneficial uh, thing, but, you know, clearly, um, you know, open source has become somewhat victim of its own success in that that, that sort of ubiquity um, has now uh, made it uh, a, a target for, for bad actors, you know, um, attacking the, the supply chain um, is in many ways probably an easier target um, than uh, than um, looking for zero day uh, um, vulnerabilities in directly in in applications, right? And and you know that's what we've seen as a trend generally in the industry. You know we see more and more of these things like typo squatting, you know, directly attacking the the package repositories, um, trying to trick people into into using alternative things. Uh, without without people realizing that they were were doing so, um, I, I think the the uh, you know clearly the the um, the seventy nine figure there is the kind of average of averages across ecosystems, and we, we see on the right hand of this slide um, that there's a lot of variation. Um, you know, I, I did get asked as a result of, of this slide should should software developers be looking to stop using JavaScript because it's clearly you know. More, more, more dangerous than any other ecosystem. But you know, the, there's things in in there's differences, fundamental differences within these software ecosystems that that will tend to to sort of skew these numbers. You know, JavaScript packages tend to be much smaller in scope. There's a lot more uh, choice uh, available within that ecosystem for things that do a, have a specific function in comparison to, you know, something like Python where there's a uh, uh, you tend to have one one package uh, that rises to the top that, that does all uh, the things for that particular uh, function. I mean, I, I, what it does say within those package ecosystems is that clearly where you where you have um, many more dependencies on average in a project in, in JavaScript, for example, that that makes the um, the scanning and awareness of, of vulnerabilities, of potential vulnerabilities in your code, probably more important. For you to consider because you are pulling in, um, pulling in, uh, 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 you know, more more third party packages there. I mean, it's worth saying that you know the uh, given that the JavaScript packages tend to be smaller in scope, you know, there's this the, you could put an argument together to say, well, uh, there's less code there, right? So you know, there's, it doesn't directly translate into more vulnerabilities being in JavaScript than anything else. But uh, I mean, it's uh, it's definitely. Uh, something to be aware of for developers within those particular ecosystems. No, it's a great, and Matt, I, I'm, I'm glad you shared that, that sort of ubiquity comment, because as we see some of these larger frameworks being shared across organizations, I, I would agree from a security perspective, path of least resistance is always the most attractive ones from an attacker perspective. It's, it's the easiest way in those common grounds. And then simultaneously, I think, um, I believe this is echoed in the report too, we're, we're seeing a growth in just open source packages, right? This continues to grow and grow and expand, which means there's a broad sort of spectrum of what can be used to consume. And I think both of those start to bring sort of their own sort of unique implications. Yeah, absolutely. I mean, you know, we've, we have, we have, uh, uh, numbers that, that we use inside sneak showing, you know, in every package ecosystem, massive, uh, trends of upwards and to the right. And, you know, well, I guess we'll touch it a bit more on, on the implications of that idea about more software being created on some of the numbers that we get to later in the deck, right? Yep, absolutely. So with that said, um, one of the other things that was um, an interesting sort of theme and actually potentially surprising, and I know that was shared inside of the, the results and some of this directly came from the, the survey itself is that there is still a lot of organizations that don't have the open source sort of security prioritized. Um, and if we look at some of the statistics and the information that was derived from the report, um, what, what you can start to capture, and one of the things that was shared was that currently across organizations, only about 49% of them, at least from the survey respondents, seem to have a, um, a security policy in place that addresses the open source um, software. And if you look on the, the left hand of your, your, your screen here too, you'll see that it it does vary across sort of the organizations and size of the organizations, right? The dark color there representing one to 500 employees and then sort of growing as you look at the green and the yellow where it's 500 to 5,000 and then 5,000 and above. Um, and what we start to see is, you know, how many of those currently have one in place? Um, and then those that 
explicitly answered no. And sort of, I think one of the more surprising ones, you know, you kind of expect that on smaller organizations, right? A newer, they're just starting up. They're just starting to get programs in place. And so building out that is, is typically part of an evolution of an organization is, is putting a little bit more of those stringent controls, the more you grow in order to address the risk. Um, but probably on the other side, is, as you look at larger organizations, you kind of expected that number to be maybe uh, a little higher, maybe a little no, lower on the, the no side. So curious again from, from Matt and Steve, from, from your perspective, talking with the organizations, what, what your thoughts on this? And then probably a, a side conversation of what, what, what you see as an impact of, of some of these responses, right? The, and I know that's a, a loaded question, but the, the impact of, you know, the, the no, we don't address it being about 30% um, in very, very large organizations, 27% is shown here. Well, let me, uh, let me comment on this first. Um, so the origin of the 49% uh, that you see on the right side of the screen is actually the overall um, number of organizations in our sample for this particular survey that said that they have a security policy for open source software in place. 34% uh, overall said they don't have a security policy for open source in place. And we had 17% that said don't know. So um, it's okay in this particular question to actually sideline the don't know, not sure's. And if we do that, the ratio of having an open source uh, software uh, policy in, uh, for security versus not having one was, six, was a 60-40 split. So it's, it's not quite as dismal as it sounds, but I, I will say there are some very alarming characteristics to what you see on the chart here. Um, the fact that we can have organizations of all sizes have at least 27, at least 27 percent of them growing to 44 percent for the small organizations, saying they have no open source software policy in place, is actually very. Uh, it's it's alarming to me because, as I said earlier, we know that 98 percent of organizations use open source software. Not having a policy in place from the standpoint of how you want to do GRC for open source, um, I think is just inviting in, um, you know, it's, it's, it's setting the stage for catastrophe, realistically. So uh, I think to me, that's very alarming. And from the standpoint of what the impact is, not having an open source security policy, which you would think would be a relatively easy offshoot of the overall security policy, means that you really have, from an open source standpoint, no way to manage the governance, the risk management, and the compliance of what you're doing with, with open source software. And I, as I said, because it's so widely used, that's, a, that's kind of a recipe for disaster. I mean, for me, I think there's a couple of, of, of interesting trends that, that, are, that are kind of, uh, uh, you know, that you can that you can view this data through through a lens of. Right. I mean, I think if we if we went back um, even even five or so years, I think you would have seen a lot smaller number of very large organizations with open source security mm -hmm. policies. I think in large enterprises, you know, you you might you might be. On the one hand, you could you could argue that that uh, you know large enterprises are much more resistant to change, and they they have a, a lot more ingrained kind of uh, uh, you know uh, legacy applications and all that kind of stuff. But I mean, actually, we've seen over the last few years a, a massive rise in open source program offices within uh, within very large organisations, and you know typically things like this. If you if you've got an open source project office, you're going to be all over this because that's what the role of your open source uh, open source program office is. And, and I think as well the you know whilst whilst the you know the we can talk about the the no figures when we look at at, at forty percent. Uh, plus of, of of small to medium enterprises having an open source policy, you know, I think that for particularly when we look at the kind of startup world, you know, these uh, any new entrant these days is in who's who's uh, at all a technology company, and you know, we have to make the assumption that that most most people starting businesses at this size are, are going to be have technology at the heart of what they do. You know they don't have that legacy there, so they're starting. They probably have a, uh, a, a development and engineering teams who are, uh, you know, used to working with open source. They've been doing it their entire careers. 
and so and they're and they're greenfield so then you know it makes it much easier for them to adopt uh new technologies and and you know understanding of how to how to best leverage open source yeah, those are those are both great points, and I, I definitely like the perspective that you know it, it, an organization that's been in motion had this evolution and adoption that probably affected their business fairly quickly versus you know some of the agility of it's just commonplace in the in the the newer ones is the startups to have something in place because it's it's a known entity, right? You're you're starting with with that, so might as well start to tackle it as soon as possible. The interesting part again is is um, as we saw a lot of the 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 threats and some of the attacks last you know over last year that it it's becoming a target um we've 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 discussed this we'll we'll talk about some of the software supply chain impacts with some of the vulnerabilities in, in a little bit but it's an an interesting area where i think it's it's by no means going away and and definitely growing in sort of presence um one of the um other things that i think that was an interesting statistic uh, that was shared in this this report was um for those that do, right? For those that are actually leveraging open source, and for um, whether or not even there's a security sort of policy in place, but you know what sort of components and approaches are in place in order to look for those risks, right? To to maybe proactively identify and understand as as you're starting to use somebody else's code, you know what what does that what risk does it pose on your organization, and can you be proactively aware of any of those and, and take action. One of the stats that came out, um, and again, want to want to share, and Steve, I'm going to let you give some insight into these numbers and what it actually entails and, and, and how you see them. But 44% of, of companies have, have some sort of approach with developers or other types of approaches of examining the source code in order to, to look for these risks. And then we saw sort of multiple sort of categories in these responses of different types of approaches in order to say, what is that risk? Like what, what is that level of trust associated with it? And can I identify any of those sort of in a proactive method? And so it was interesting to see sort of some of those and which ones are more common across the different, different organizations. Yeah, uh, two key points here. First, um, the 44% bar, the, the, obviously the tallest one. Um, the response there was we use tools to examine its source code, you know, open source source code. Um, really, what that represents is sort of a holistic view of are we using tools, and tools could be, are typically, prompt, typically going to be uh, dedicated open source security tools. Um, like SCA, SAST, DAST, and IAC. Well, it's not dedicated to security, but it has a big impact on security. Uh, and there's about 10 categories overall of these kinds of tools. Um, a lot of these tools are in use today and they're very effective at helping improve your security posture. So, uh, so it's good to see that um, nearly half of organizations uh, are overall are using tools. Um, and then many of the other bars are really interesting because the subset of them essentially say that the community that stands behind the open source component that we are looking to use um, is vibrant, it is uh, responsible, it has the right kinds of people and maintainers and core contributors in it, uh, and the right kinds of cycle times to be um, to give us confidence that there the care and feeding of this particular component is ongoing and this is a component that we can have a level of trust in so i think those are the two things that kind of jump out at me me in this question yeah i mean i i think from my perspective what's actually uh uh, uh, good to see here is that um, you know we're uh, uh, as well as focusing on the on the code. What we're seeing here is um, at least some level of understanding about what the uh, key kind of metrics of health you should be looking at in in open source projects. And you know it's a, uh, it's not just about about function. You know when you when you're looking at, at uh, uh, using and uh, integrating something uh, open source, you really want to be looking at you know how healthy is that developer community. You know how often are, is, are people committing to it? How wide a developer base does it have? And what's the governance of that project, right? Because you know we've we've seen it recently.
recently with some of these uh, ransomware things in the JavaScript community, like the colors and faker incidents, where we have uh, single maintainer projects where the maintainers kind of gone rogue and you know put in code that uh, that potentially can cause problems to uh, to users or in in other cases have removed the functionality of the product altogether of the project altogether um and so um you know these things about uh you know looking at uh, package download stats looking at commit uh, commit cycles uh, releases you know and and um and you know checking what the governance of the project is is uh it's good to see that people are recognizing that those are important things as well as just purely focusing on the code and i think we're seeing a evolution as well in the kinds of tools that are available to people uh to make those kind of judgments you know for a long time you might be looking purely at uh, commit histories or you know if you were working with github looking at stars and that those are kind of quite very broad brush metrics in a sense but you know we're starting to see uh things like with the open ssf scorecards um program you know having ways where we can uh, even programmatically uh, assess whether a you know what the security kind of health of that of that project is overall yeah i think the the one thing it, uh, building on both of those that that i think was interesting to me is this this starts to actually build almost an industry best practice on some of those judgment protocols so like looking i mean e e checking to see if there's a responsible disclosure policy in an open source package is an interesting sort of approach right and then looking at man as you just mentioned the maintainers and that trust um sort of mechanism as well as automated solutions to provide that that guidance for you but all of these sort of multiple layers of of knowing you know is this something that i have confidence in and can have that trust relationship and there's these are multiple sort of layers of, of judgment. Um, I mean, I think that that security, the the the, uh, the the fairly low scoring of the security MD mm -hmm. is an interesting one because, you know, the the security MD is a, uh, a kind of uh, community uh, sort of standard that's been around for a very long time in, in open source communities. You know, we have a kind of uh, best practices of having a number of these files exist in the root of, of an open source repository, things like contributing.md, which is going to give you information about contributing to the project. And the, the security MD is actually a very long standing um, thing, but it's interesting that not many people uh, consider that to be, uh, you know, uh, um, an important health metric. You know, yeah. one, of the, one of the things that this also suggests, and we haven't talked about yes, our, our, yet, our software bill of materials, yeah. um, that is a, a very important dimension of solving this particular problem. Um, and of course, I was instrumental in helping the Linux Foundation put a report out on it at the very beginning of this year. So uh, check out that report on software bill of materials if, um, if you have an interest in it. It's a very comprehensive report. But with respect to what it is here, there's, there's three things that a software bill of materials gives you. It gives you a lot of understanding about the existing component. And so there's a very rich metadata. Uh, and that is instrumental in understanding, you know, who was responsible for it, what is, the, what is this all about, it's got the source code um, also. So, uh, so it gives you that rich source of understanding about what this component is, what it's supposed to do, and information about um, its license, information about its vulnerabilities. Uh, um, so it has info on what's been, what's been fixed, um, and then by looking at the various, you know, uh, registries, um, either US focused or worldwide focused, you can sort of deduce what hasn't been fixed. Um, and this is, uh, this would be absolutely critical from the standpoint of, of understanding the, the knowledge, the tr having trust in it, because this information is non falsifiable, and understanding usability, which has to do with its licensing. So um, SBOMs are a very important part of the equation here. Um, we didn't spend a lot of time on it on this yeah. particular yeah. study, but still very important to uh, to recognize. Yeah, I definitely see. I, I think we'll see that as a as a theme as we discuss some of these other. The other interesting part about this, Matt, kind of building on that that security and being a, a a prominent approach, is also that it it illustrates that there's 
many different vectors. And so it, it can be sort of intimidating and, and burdensome in order to actually investigate those. And we'll see a little bit of the, the themes, I think, that was derived out of this report about reliance upon other entities in order to help provide some of that guidance, which I think is critical. It's also captured here, right? We can see in some of these stacks about relying upon the community, relying upon, you know, vendors and solutions to also help provide some of that guidance because it's 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 definitely, you know, um, uh, puts a big burden on individuals in order to try to do this across the board with every single one, especially when we talk about the average being 80, 80 or just direct dependencies within within an app and within an um, application using open source software. Well, I think ultimately at the end of the day, we're, we need to have an automated approach to how to deal with all this information. And I think that's, yeah. that's within reach at this point. Yeah. Agreed. yeah, and I mean, in some ways, the scorecards stuff plays into that, you know, that's all about a standardized format that can be read programmatically uh, straight out the repository with, you know, a whole set of uh, of sort of health and security uh, metrics in there that uh, that can be interpreted programmatically. Awesome. Well, let's let's transition and talking to probably one of the more prominent sort of discussions that happened last year um, and some take takeaways that I think, you know, you, when you start to look at some of the the details and some of the information that that shared as well from from the log for shell vulnerability. So, you know, December last year, I think um, anybody in security was probably very well aware of um, some of the scrambling associated with trying to identify or remediate a lot of the impact of a very prominent open source package. And Matt talking about some of the ubiquity you mentioned before about a very, very common component that's very popular and used across the industry, all of a sudden had this 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 risk exposed and sort of the, the scrambling in order to actually address those. Um, a couple of sort of intriguing elements that I think that that were shared was, and, and some of this is again from, from what was seen, is that, you know, 79, percent of uh, of applications that had this log for shell vulnerability and log for j um, had it more than once right it was it was actually embedded inside of the application in multiple locations um, the other interesting one and this is one of those things that we talked about when you start to look at the complexity um, of open source and the open source relationships and the hierarchies and one of the reasons Steve like like you just mentioned that that software bill of materials that s bomb I think is is a extremely critical is understanding that hierarchy and relationship and having it both for reference as well as communication and documentation. This illustrates that, you know, when we looked at some of the um, the data that 60% of instances of, you know, log for j vulnerabilities as part of the log for shell sort of exploit was found in indirect dependencies, meaning it was potentially buried several layers deep on another open source package that relied upon it which meant you had to figure out what the solution was in probably a slightly different manner. So we'd love to get sort of the insight and take is um, both, both from you and Matt and, and Steve um, on any sort of other impacts that you saw and how you saw organizations actually handling this, right? What, what was some of the approaches for some of these complex sort of problems that they had to deal with? Well, I mean, I, I, sorry, Steve. Ahead. That's all right, you start. I mean, I was just going to say this is this is kind of a, a almost a if you if you wanted to come up with a perfect illustrative example of this whole problem space, you really couldn't have invented one that was that was any better than this, right? You you've got a a uh, a logging component in Java, incredibly widely used. It's basically you know the standard way to do this in in Java. It's in an ecosystem that is you know, used gigantically inside enterprises, you know, people with huge, uh, huge amounts of internal software, business critical software written in Java. Um, and those kinds of Java applications tend to be, uh, uh, you know, complex, multi-layered with dependencies, you know, lots of indirect dependencies. And so, you know, this was a, a perfect storm, really. And I mean, you know, it, it's um it, 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 you know having a, having a component like that, that 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 is used by almost everybody is is not necessarily a bad thing and i mean under a lot of circumstances you would have thought that the you know the the kind of uh 
Linus's law thing about eyeballs would have would have been, you know, for those of you who aren't old enough to remember this, this is that, uh, you know, I'll paraphrase a bit because I can't remember Eric Raymond's exact <laughs> terminology, but, you know, that uh, that all all bugs are shallow given given a, uh, a large number of eyeballs. Um, but, you know, this was really just a, a, a use case that people hadn't considered when a particular commit was put in. This is going back some years. Um, and so, you know, uh, very, very widely, uh, you know, vulnerable, almost everybody in the uh, in the kind of Java ecosystem and, um, you know, kind of difficult unless you've got scanning tools and you've got scanning tooling in place to to really be able to to scan all of your applications at a, at a you know, multi nested level, uh, you were going to have a problem. And, and I mean, this is still going on, right, because there was also a uh, huge exposure to this in the embedded space and you know embedded devices if there were something's flashed into hardware is a, a much much harder um problem to upgrade than than enterprise applications yeah in many ways this is a perfect advertisement for um software composition analysis tools because these tools once the vulnerability has been identified these tools can go out and tell you where all the instances of that of those vulnerabilities are and once you know where they all are, um, you know, you can do automated remediation potentially, although I certainly would mm -hmm. do a lot of testing uh, if I was going to go down that path. Um, but that, um, but here's a great example of how tooling can provide um, a, a very effective and scalable way uh, to go find the problems and help you get them, get them uh, remediated in, in a very, in very short order. I mean, there were fixes available for this very, very quickly once the exploit had been uh, out in the wild. And, you know, if, if you were uh, using um, SCA tooling, you were able to find and fix it very quickly. Um, but I think, uh, you know, what was clear to me when, you know, with my with my kind of sneak hat on was that it, it, there were an awful lot of people who didn't have software composition analysis in place, who were suddenly scrambling to find a software composition analysis um, uh, we certainly had a, a, a very large spike in new users during this uh, during this period. Yeah, you know, um, we it's, a, it's also interesting. I just make one one more point here. You know, which is kind of you know again sli slightly uh, slightly um, tangential, but it, you know because you could argue, well, we should never have you know applications that are this ubiquitous because they're always going to be. You know a, a point of attack but I, I think probably if you looked at the you know the the total cost of development for for every you know java application to have written its own logging code versus the cost of remediating uh log for shell you know you you may find that uh that it's that it's surprising in a very large ecosystem like that right because we'd be talking about millions of hours of developer time that that would be required to re-implement well, <laughs> the linux foundation for years has had research going on to understand what the most widely used you know software mm -hmm. components were yeah. we, we do this across many different categories and identify the top 500 and so uh, this is all being done on purpose so that we know what's widely used yeah. and, and we can pro provide a much higher level of scrutiny on those highly used uh, components so that issues like this will be in, in hopefully far less likely to happen in the future when we get a more a more emphasis on security for those widely used components and, and yeah, by the way yeah. on um, on sca tooling there's a statistic in the report although not in the slide deck here 46 percent of organizations in our sample use uh, sca tools mm -hmm. so we don't even have a majority using them yet and that was probably why as um, as matt said the scramble for uh, for use of that technology after after log 4 j was was found and i think and that, that oh, sorry, sorry i was just going to say i think that that scramble is probably illustrated by the the stat on the right right it's it's one thing when you've got a direct dependency it's fixed you simply replace it it's it's another thing when you're trying to figure out the hierarchy and interrelationship and it's not just something you go to you go sort of you know directly upgrade yourself this is also very th this whole situation Matt to your sort of point about being a perfect storm to me also like 
rolls back to one of the other themes that we saw earlier of why the criticality of having some sort of a um, security policy associated with open source becomes so critical because that starts to dictate the software bill of materials that starts to dictate mm -hmm. you know having some sort of solution in place that, so that you can not only be proactive of, of having the ability to inspect and find things and and take the appropriate action but when situations where you need to be highly reactive you know, are, are dictated, you've got a plan in place in order to actually execute on those, which is, this is exactly what happened here is it was a highly reactive sort of situation. And understanding your risk was extremely critical as part of being able to take action in a reactive fashion. Yeah, and I mean, if you were doing this manually, it would just be impossible. I mean, you know, there's, especially in an enterprise, I mean, you, you've got to have automated systems in place here that are maintaining that that list. And that list comes from you know, uh, uh, scanning of, of some description when during your software development life cycle. Excellent. So I think that that, that, that actually um, rolls well into, I think, one of the other common themes that we we saw as part of some of the information that was shared was, you know, fi finding a solution, a complex solution for this complex problem. You know, there's there's different approaches across the industry. And it was interesting to see some of the the data that was shared as far as um, some of the the um, trends um, that are in the market, both from one, you know, looking at open source itself, and then two, looking at organizations and how they're handling it. From a from a first perspective, we 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 have seen a very interesting one, and I know there's there's probably many sort of stories and reasons why a lot of this this may have happened, but you know, the the time to fix vulnerabilities. So if you look back just a few years ago. 2018, you know, the average time for open source to actually remediate issues was around 49 days. Um, that's increased. It's it's gone up based upon you know some of the um, the 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 data that we were able from a state perspective in order to to share. Um, in addition to that, fixing vulnerabilities. So the approach to actually solving problems when there's open source involved is actually potentially takes a little longer than. The, and you know, fixing those in the open source takes a lot longer than some of the first party code that's being used inside of organizations. So I, I know, you know, Matt, Steve, you probably got some insight that that I think is extremely interesting to share as far as the reasons why you, you believe we're we're seeing some of these trends. Like it doesn't feel like it's a good thing, but it, it doesn't mean it's also bad. Yeah, this is uh, nothing more than this is to be expected. This is the sign of the times. Um, three years is quite a long time, especially from the standpoint of how security has evolved and, and the use and how the use of open source software has uh, dramatically increased. So uh, we've got organizations building more software today because it is such a strategic advantage for them. Um, we've got more open source software componentry you know, coming into the marketplace. Um, we have a much greater emphasis on security these days and, and looking across the life cycle of, of app dev to be able to deal with security issues. Um, and there's lots more observability and visibility into vulnerabilities um, these days than there ever has been in the past. So I think a lot of this is conspiring to find more information uh, these days relative to what we had at our disposal in the past. So I'm not surprised to see this number go up. Um, but I think the one thing I will say is that when you look at the profile of vulnerabilities and those that are most critical, um, those that are most critical is are typically a smaller number, even by language, um, and they get resolved very quickly. Uh, but with well, all open source components, we have many low level uh, vulnerabilities that you know also need to be resolved. But because they're low level, they're not important, they're not gonna cause or, or lead to uh, huge exploits potentially, then that means those can sit out there for a long time because of resource issues uh, that pretty much everybody has. Um, and it's to be expected that this number will increase, but it doesn't necessarily mean, necessarily uh, indicate that that's a bad thing. Yeah, and I mean, uh, you know, uh, when looking at looking at the whole of, of ecosystems in in kind of aggregate is is uh, you know not all projects are created equal either, right? I mean, you know, we're a very broad church in the open source community from, you know, uh, huge scale projects like the Linux kernel, like Kubernetes, where almost every Everybody on those projects is a is these days is employed by a company to work full time on that project. 
And, you know, for every one of those, there is 10 or 100,000 tiny little projects that are, that are being done in someone's spare time. And, you know, so the, the, when, you, when you're developing uh, uh, something in your spare time and you're trying to develop new features, you're trying to support your user base, you know, there's a, there's a limited amount of resource there. And I, and I think what Steve's perfectly right there, that what we're seeing is this sort of low level of vulnerabilities, probably more, um, you know, more towards the, the low medium type of, of, of severity. And that's growing because, you know, we, we just haven't got the resources in across a lot of projects for, for folks to be, um, to be uh, to have time to fix them, and also having access to the kind of information to be able to fix them, right? I mean, you know, this is this is what the what the one of the open SSF's missions is is to provide that information to uh, to open source contributors, to open source maintainers, you know, to provide tooling and um, security uh, information at scale. To you know the to to a wide uh, a very wide range of, of open source projects and so uh, hopefully those initiatives as those start to kick in will start to see this this maybe slow down this trend and, and you know ideally reverse but uh... yeah I would agree and I, I do like the 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 theme of of um, the Links Foundation of pushing more for community and giving back and getting more individuals involved in these because I think that'll have a direct impact on some of these types of changes, right? There's large organizations, large sort of open source projects have a lot of resources and a lot of people working on it. The smaller ones, and I think one of the statistics was 30% of, of a lot of open source packages have a single maintainer and some have none. And so when, when, when you're limited on those resources, it makes, you know, the ability to change some of those things a little bit more difficult because it's not always your, your full-time job or, or your first yeah, job. And I mean, this, this has got to be a, a two-pronged approach here. You know, this, from the end user perspective, you know, clearly as we looked at the policy numbers and stuff like that, we've still got some way to go in educating uh, end user organizations about how they need to manage their risk in terms of open source but at the same time you know we've got to provide resources and and uh and um and support to the grassroots community level so that they can get better at doing uh better at doing security as well excellent so what one of the other things that was extracted from some of the data was was some of the approaches that are being used by the industry as far as like so how do they tackle this? How do they look for security vulnerabilities? And I think, and, and maybe obvious, but it's it's probably one that makes sense and consistent that we see some common themes as far as when we look at you know some of the solutions that are being used in the market in order to address, discover, remediate these types of approaches that SaaS static application security testing, we've mentioned SCA software composition analysis, right? Are are some of those unique approaches? But then we also see some of um, additional. Um, ones that are in there. So interested a little bit on on your feedback as far as, um, you know, is this this surprising? If you've seen, you know, is this lacking or, you know, some of the other areas? And I think one of the other things we haven't talked a lot about is just education too, which is a big sort of component of, you know, how we actually approach this in a more effective manner as well. Yeah, this is, um, this is a very good sign this particular chart because it, it shines a bright light on SAS and SCA tools. Um, and those are the really the two most popular tools and have been for a while when it comes to dealing with security. Um, what this particular question doesn't tell us, but it does, but we, we see it elsewhere in the report, um, are that infrastructure as code IAC tools are used uh, quite a bit. There are very, organizations very heavily reliant on it as well to deal with security because of the automation that it can provide across CICD and more automation means less manual touch points where you can uh, do things that help expose you to exploits. Um, and then finally, uh, what's not said here is DAST, the Dynamic Application Security Testing Tools. Um, so you know, web application scanners, fuzz testing tools, tools that are typically used when an application is in production, not during development. Um, so that's another key category that actually ranks uh, medium high uh, from the standpoint of usage, um, but has, did actually show up in this particular question. So um, I would make the case here that really um, 
a combination of SAST, SCA, DAST, and IAC is probably one of your best defenses from the standpoint of being able to be address security in a more effective way. Yeah, I mean, I, I think, um, you know, it's great. What, what's the interesting takeaway for, for me is, you know, uh, the correlation here between uh, the uh, people actually using um, uh, uh, security tooling and having a security policy, right? right. So you know that that correlation, and we've seen this in, in lots of other um, in lots of other survey work that we've done at Sneak. I mean, I, I, I think uh, one of the most important things in this space really is is about automation and you know embedding security tooling all the way through your software development lifecycle. You know, we we have to. Move Move to this model of kind of developer first security and, and having developers be uh, have the the responsibility and the tools available to them to to fix um stuff uh, you know in the uh in this in the software development life cycle and i think we see this through through this right you know we're using ides uh tooling and ides tooling in command lines tooling in ci and all these things have a subtly different, uh, subtly different reasoning uh, to use them at that particular point in the SDLC. But um, you know, it, uh, we did some work last year around the uh, the cloud native application security um, report, and you know, for for organisations with fully automated uh, CI/CD pipelines, we saw much bigger take up of, of security tooling because it's easier to integrate when you're automating stuff already. And then we see a gigantic increase in uh, in time to fix. So, you know, the, these things have a have a real impact. And uh, and I think if you're if you're good at that automated deployment piece, it becomes much easier to integrate security into it. Yeah, it's an interesting. I think it actually it, it transitions over to one of sort of the, the key takeaways, Matt, because I think this echoes exactly what we're just talking about is the um, the mature of of the ability to address a lot of these security issues is probably directly proportional to the automation associated with it. it's only what it's going to be the only way you can you can scale it accordingly and so if we looked at you know knowing um we're, we're just about to the top of the hour of, of some of the key takeaways um that i think you know are, are derived from from the information that was um extracted and shared is there's there's a few approaches and i think one of these i, I picked at one of the questions that was queued up in there specifically around you know how do you how do you get um let me rephrase that how do you make sure that things are met in standard security processes and um practices are in place especially with with devops and i think this aligns directly to that right so some of the key takeaways that i think you can derive from this report is involving developers in order to in, in, um, improve their security knowledge so and that's a combination of you know, security awareness and training. Um, so providing some of those details and guidance associated with why you're asking them to include that in there, providing that, opening up the kimono a little bit and sharing some of the details and insight. And I think empowering them in order to actually make the decisions uh, most effectively and given the guidance on solving those problems can be extremely effective as far as improving your security posture across your organization. Um, Hand in hand with that, and what we just discussed, right, is is leveraging uh, specialized security tools. So, SCA and SAST, I don't think are going anywhere because they they do provide some of that that guidance associated with it. And I think one of the other interesting, this is inside the report, which I will share the link to um, or the details associated with it here in just a second. But one of the themes that that I think towards the end of the report that was also shared was. Um, a lot of individuals are are looking at at vendors in the industry to help provide that guidance. They know they can't take that burden on themselves. There's a a lot of sort of elements of of understanding security postures continuously and monitoring and looking for those risks. And as we talked about, even with open source, all of those different sort of vectors of inspection in order to identify areas of trust can be very, very, you know, and daunting if you were looking at doing it yourselves. And so relying on outside, you know, industry and vendors in order to provide a lot of that, that work for them and guidance and help solve those problems. And then kind of that last theme, um, and this is, again, we just, we just touched on quite a bit was automate, 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 right? The, the, the only way that you're going to be able to address a lot of these security issues without impacting the speed of innovation is going to be embedding a lot of these types of things 
as early and often in sort of the development process and empowering sort of all of those members across your organization to make them security individuals, make them or allow them to actually have a lot of the um, interaction and the ability to, to make those decisions based upon providing that guidance um, and details and insight and feedback as early as possible, but doing so that it works inside of sort of the, um, the approach that they use inside of your organization. So with that said, here's the um, last thing I'll, I'll use just to wrap up is um, the, the full report's available. There's a lot of additional details you can actually see in the screenshot there. There's some summarized sort of statistics that we saw that more intelligence tools I just mentioned is actually um, uh, shared right there. But then there's a lot of other additional insight that I think is extremely useful inside of this report um, that, you know, downloading it and, and reading it yourselves, I think is extremely valuable. And one of the things Steve is part of, um, co-authoring this report too, because I think there's a lot of useful information and data. Um, with that said, I think there was one question. And yeah, I think we actually, go ahead. You just picked up on that. On a, I just wanted to answer the, the other side of that question that you picked okay. up on there, Mick, which is how should we consider the platform and DevOps side of security stuff? Well, oh. you know, very, very briefly, in exactly the same way that you consider your application code, right? I mean, that 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 movement, you know, towards uh, removing manual intervention, infrastructure as code, most, uh, there are many, many scanners out there in the marketplace for scanning infrastructure as code. And, um, you know, I think we've got this kind of emerging field of cloud security posture management, which is, is the sort of flip side to that of looking at your live environments and testing those uh, it, it, it live and comparing it back to what you had defined in code. So I think that's definitely the direction of travel. If you're not there already, that's definitely where you should be going in terms of considering uh, the, your kind of platform side of, of security. Just treat, treat it like software development, runs through CI, gets scanned. Yeah, let me, uh, let me add something to this. Um, so adding to the conclusions, um, number one, <laughs> Uh, from the standpoint of developers and security professionals was more intelligence in, in tooling from vendors. And number two was um, a higher level of reliance on best practices when it came to uh, security policy. And so I think uh, to, the, to this question, I think best practices could go a long way to helping you understand from, uh, from the standpoint of a framework for helping me understand where we are currently from the standpoint of best practices and use, best practices uh, and gradated, uh, gradated, or I can't say the word, but uh, from the standpoint of you know uh, things you should do first versus follow a life cycle essentially of best practices. Um, Linux Foundation has already built um, these best practices. Go to uh, OpenSSF.org. Uh, and look up best practices, you'll see a course in there for secure software development. Uh, this was written by David Wheeler, one of, the, one of the industry experts in the space. There's about 150 best practices in total. Uh, you don't need to sort of try to, you know, eat the elephant all in one bite, uh, but there's a course, there's certification, it's all free. Uh, this I think could give you a great view into not only uh, what you should be doing from an organizational standpoint and relative to what you've already done, but also understand from a, from a perspective of how should we improve our security posture over time, it'll give you a lot of good ideas uh, from the standpoint of what these best practices represent and, and what they do. So I think highly recommend it as a way to help yeah. address the problem and the question here. Excellent. Thanks, Steve. Appreciate that additional insight. With that, I know we're right at, we're probably actually a little past. So Candace, I will turn it back over to the Linux Foundation in order to wrap up. Thank you so much, Mick, Steve, and Matt for your time today. And thank you everyone for joining us. As a reminder, this recording will be on the Linux Foundation YouTube page later today. We hope you join us for future webinars. Have a wonderful day.